Alliance Francaise, and today I will be reading Chapter 4 from Bonjour Tristes by Françoise Segal. What surprised me most during the days that followed was how extremely nice Anne was to Elsa. Elsa's conversation was sprinkled with numerous idiotic remarks, but Anne never responded to them by uttering any of those curt phrases that she had such a knack for, and that would have made poor Elsa look ridiculous. I inwardly commended her for her patience and generosity without realizing how much shrewdness was involved. My father would quickly have tired of any such savage little game. Instead, he was grateful to her and could not do enough to express his appreciation. In any case, this gratitude of his was only a cover. There was no doubt that when he spoke to her, it was as to a highly respected woman, a second mother to his daughter. He even played that card by seeming constantly to put Anne in charge of me, making her to a certain extent responsible for the kind of person I was, as if to bring her closer and bind her to us more tightly. But he would look at her and motion to her as to a woman he did not know but whom he desired to know. To know, that is, in an intimate way. It was the same kind of considerateness as that I sometimes detected in Cyril, which made me want simultaneously to run from him and to lead him on. I must have been more impressionable than Anne. She responded to my father with an indifference and in a serene good grace that put my mind at rest. I reached the stage of thinking that I had been mistaken that first day. I failed to see that this sheer good grace of hers was hugely appealing to my father. And above all, there were her silences. Silences that seemed so natural and so elegant. They formed a sort of antithesis to Elsa's constant chirruping, like the contrast between sun and shade. Poor Elsa, she really did not suspect anything. She went on being loud and overexcited and still just as wilted looking from the sun. One day, however, she must have realized. She must have intercepted a glance from my father. I saw her murmur something in his ear before lunch. For a moment, he looked surprised and put out, but then he nodded with a smile. At coffee, Elsa stood up, walked over to the door, and turned towards us in a languorous way, greatly inspired, it seemed to me, by American movies, and, injecting into her intonation ten years' worth of French amorousness, said, Are you coming, Raymond? My father stood up, blushing almost, and followed her out, extolling the virtues of the siesta. Anne had not moved. Smoke curled up from the cigarette she held between her fingers. I felt obligated to say something. People maintain that a siesta is very restful, but I don't think that's true. I stopped myself immediately, conscious of the amb ambiguity of what I was saying. Please, said Anne coldly. She had not even taken my comment to be ambiguous. She had straight away seen it as being a joke and poor taste. I looked at her. She was wearing a deliberately calm, relaxed expression, which I found disturbing. Perhaps at that moment she was madly jealous of Elsa. A cynical idea for cheering her up occurred to me, and as I was pleased by it, as I was by all my cynical ideas, bolstered by a sort of confidence and a sense of colluding with myself that was quite intoxicating, I could not resist putting my thoughts into words. Mind you, with Elsa being so sunburnt, that kind of siesta can't be much fun for either of them. I would have done better to not have spoken. I detest that kind of remark, said Anne. At your age, it's worse than stupid. It's tiresome. I promptly lost my nerve. I only said it as a joke. I'm sorry. I'm sure they're very happy, really. She turned to face me with a weary look. I immediately apologized. She closed her eyes and began to speak in a low, patient voice. Your idea of love is a rather simplistic one. Love isn't a series of isolated sensations. It struck me that that was just what all of my experiences of love had been. A sudden surge of emotion at someone's gaze or gesture or kiss. Radiant moments without any underlying connection. That was all the memory I had of them. It's something different, Anne was saying. It's about constant tenderness, gentleness, missing a person. Things you wouldn't understand. She made an evasive gesture and picked up a magazine. I would have preferred it if she had shown anger at my emotional deficiency or had abandoned that air of resigned indifference. It struck me that th she was right, that I lived on an animal level, letting myself be led by the wishes of others, and that I was a poor, weak creature. I, des I despised myself, and it was terribly painful to me because I wasn't used to that, to passing judgment on my actions, so to speak, as to whether they were good or bad. 
I went up to my room and mused a bit. The sheets were warm beneath me. I could still hear Anne's words. What's different about it is missing a person. Had I ever missed anyone? I can no longer recall the various events of that fortnight. As I've said already, I didn't want to face up to there being any precise threat to our happiness. I do, of course, recall very clearly the rest of the holiday because I brought to bear on it all my attention and all that I was capable of. But as for those first three weeks, which were in fact three happy weeks, which day was it that my father looked very conspicuously at Anne's mouth? Was it the day he reproached her out loud for her, her aloofness while pretending to laugh at it? Or when in all seriousness he compared her subtlety to the half-wittedness of Elsa? My peace of mind rested on the stupid notion that if they had been bound to love each other, having known each other for 15 years, they would have started sooner. What's more, I said to myself, if it has to happen, my father will be in love for three months and Anne will carry away from it a few passionate memories and a mild sense of humiliation. Yet, surely I knew that Anne was not a woman whom you could abandon just like that. But Cyril was there, and he was all I needed to think about. In the evenings, we would often go out together to nightclubs in Saint-Tropez, where we would dance to the swooning rhythms of a clarinet, murmuring words of love that I had forgotten by the following morning, but at the time had sounded so sweet. During the day, we went sailing round the coast. My father sometimes came with us. He thought a lot of Cyril, especially since the latter had let him win in a race they had had doing crawl. He called him Cyril, my boy, and Cyril called him Sir, but I sometimes wondered which of the two was the true adult. One afternoon, we went to tea with Cyril's mother. She was a placid, smiling old lady who talked to us about the difficulties she had experienced as a widow and a mother. My father commiserated with her, looking across to Anne to indicate that he recognized what was being described and complimented the lady profusely. I must say he was always confident of being able to put his time to good use. Anne gazed upon the spectacle with an amiable smile. On our return, she declared the lady to be charming. I burst out in imprecations against old ladies of that type. They each bestow bestowed an indignant... They each bestowed an indulgent, amused smile on me, which made me furious. You don't realize how pleased with herself she is, I cried. She congratulates herself on the life she has had because she feels she has done her duty and... But it's true, said Anne. She has fulfilled her duties as a wife and a mother, as the saying goes. And what about her duties as a whore, I said. I dislike coarseness, said Anne, even when it's meant to be clever. But it's not meant to be clever. She got married just as everyone gets married, either because they want to or because it's the thing, it's the done thing. She had a child. Do you know how children come about? I'm probably less well informed than you, said Anne sarcastically, but I do have some idea. So she brought the child up. She probably spared herself the anguish and upheaval of committing adultery. She has led the life of thousands of other women, and she thinks that's something to be proud of, you understand. She found herself in the position of being a young, middle-class wife and mother, and she did nothing to get out of that situation. She pats herself on the back for not having done this or that, rather than for actually having accomplished something. What you're saying doesn't make much sense, said my father. You get lured into it, I cried. Later on, you can say to yourself, I've done my duty, but only because you've done nothing at all. If, with her background, she had become a streetwalker, then she would have deserved some credit. Your ideas may be fashionable, but they're worthless, Anne said. That was perhaps true. I believed what I was saying, but it was true that I had heard other people say those things. Even so, the life my father and I led tended to support the theory, and in casting scorn on it, Anne was being hurtful to me. One can be just as much attached to frivolity as to anything else. But Anne did not consider me to be a creature capable of thought. All at once it seemed urgent, indeed essential, to disabuse her. I did not think that the opportunity would present itself to me so soon, nor that I would know how to grasp it. Anyhow, I was the first to admit that in a month's time I would have a different opinion on any given subject and that my convictions would not last. I could hardly be said to have high ideals. That's all for today. Thank you.